All right. Okay. <clears throat> and we'll go ahead and start then. Yeah, why don't we go ahead and start? Um, people will come aboard, and if they want to catch up, they can listen to the recording at some point. Mark is at a, uh, a meeting tonight, so he's not going to join us. So I, what I'm going to do is, because we don't assume everyone has read the material uh, or had a chance to look at the chapter, I'll be doing a summary of it. And tonight we're going to be looking at the chapter on Psalm 22. And I thought because all of the material, well, almost all of the material deals directly with Psalm 22, I'd like to have it fresh in everybody's mind and so that we can all start at the same place. Psalm 22 is a little bit lengthy, but um, I, think, I think we need to hear it. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me from the words of my groaning? Oh, my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night, but find no rest. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. In you our ancestors trusted. They trusted, and you delivered them. To you they cried and were saved. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. But I am a worm and not human, scorned by others and despised by the people. All who see me mock at me, they make mouths at me, they shake their heads. Commit your cause to the Lord, let him deliver, let him rescue the one in whom he delights. Yet it was you who took me from the womb, you kept me safe on my mother's breast. On you I was cast from my birth, and since my mother bore me, you have been my God. Do not be far from me, for trouble is near, and there is no one to help. Many bulls encircle me. Strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They open wide their mouths at me like a ravening and roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within my breast. My mouth is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me down in the dust of the earth. For dogs are all around me, a company of evildoers encircles me. My hands and feet have shriveled. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my clothes among themselves, and for my clothing they cast lots. But you, O Lord, do not be far away. O my help, come quickly to my aid. Deliver my soul from the sword, my life from the power of the dog. Save me from the mouth of the lion. From the horns of the wild oxen, you have rescued me. I will tell of your name to my brothers and sisters. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him. Stand in awe of him, all you offspring of Israel. He did not despise or abhor the affliction of the afflicted. He did not hide his face from me but heard when I cried to him. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I will pay before those who fear him. The poor shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations shall worship before him. For dominion belongs to our Lord, and he rules over the nations. To him indeed shall all who sleep in the earth bow down, bow down before him shall bow, all who go down to the dust, and I shall live for him. Posterity will serve him, future generations will be told about the Lord, and proclaim his deliverance to a people yet unborn, saying that he has done it. So that's Psalm 22, and really the, the whole impetus of our of our study tonight. Um, I'm going to share my screen and walk through a, a summary of the first part, and then I'll have Josh pick up um, the portion that deals with Jew Jewish interpretation. <clears throat> so we're looking at the Bible with and without Jesus, Psalm 22, and it is the beginning of the psalm, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me, that immediately in Christians trigger 
uh, a connection to the crucifixion of Christ. And as you will see as we go through this, um, uh, Psalm 22 has a particular meaning and has been laid over the entire crucifixion scene in such a way that it is a really uh, central and pivotal kind of psalm uh, for Christians during Holy Week. So what is it? It's a psalm of lament, but it's also ultimately of hope. And so it starts out with the despair, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And by the end, um, you know, the generations will be giving praise to God. So it does end on a high note, even though it is a lament. And as I said, it is pivotal to the entire depiction of Jesus' death on the cross, and that's what we're going to look at now. So all four of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, all four of them refer to verse 18, where it says, They divide my clothes among themselves, and for my clothing they cast lots, because the Roman soldiers cast lots for Jesus' garments. The mocking of Jesus' opponents reflects verses 7 and 8. All who see me mock at me, they make mouths at me, they shake their heads, and commit your cause to the Lord, let him deliver, let him rescue the one in whom he delights. And so as examples, the Gospel of Mark says, those who pass by derided them, shaking their heads, and that, that reflects verse 7 in the psalm. And the religious leaders also mocked him among themselves, saying, he saved others, he cannot save himself. And so that refers to verse, verse 8. And so as you can see already, the gospel um, writers are gleaning different pieces from the uh, psalm and, and weaving it into the crucifixion story. The voice of the psalm, however, calls upon God to save the innocent sufferer which is different because in Mark, those who taunt call on Jesus to save himself. So there is that, that caveat. Uh, Matthew also talks about the taunting. Um, he this is what they, uh, is said to Jesus on the cross. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now if he wants to, for he said, I am God's son. And this is seen as a reflection of verses 4. Four and five from Psalm 22. In your in you our ancestors trusted, they trusted and you delivered them. To you they cried and were saved. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. And so there's the if you trust in God, let God deliver you. You know, um, certainly that will happen according to the psalm. Also, an echo of verse eight: "Commit your cause to the Lord; let Him deliver." That may be behind the Synoptic Gospels, which means Matthew, Mark, and Luke, not John. The plea from the good thief, where he says, "Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom." So, it's understood, perhaps, that that Jesus, um, uh, the the thief, is committing his cause to the Lord. And asking for deliverance in the in the request that he makes while they're hanging together on the on crosses. <clears throat> What's interesting, um, and I hadn't thought of this for a while, um, the Gospel of John has what's called a very high Christology, which means a very developed theological Jesus who seems to be almost kind of above a lot of the action, a less human Jesus, if you will. And so, not surprisingly, the Gospel of John does not portray an abandoned Jesus. And so, much of the lament uh, that is found in Psalm 22 does not appear um, in the Gospel of John. However, verse 15 of the psalm says, My mouth is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death. The Gospel of John says, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said, in order to fulfill the scripture, I'm thirsty. And so there's some thought that perhaps this tongue sticking and the, my mouth dried is, is perhaps a connection to the, the I thirst word from Jesus. When John indicates Jesus was already dead, the bones then don't need to be broken in order to hasten death, and the soldier reaches up and pierces the side of Jesus. There's some connection with verses 16 and 17. They have pierced my hands and feet. I can count all my bones. And so the word pierced 
and bones are reflected uh, in the psalm and, and very much a part of, of John's account. In a little bit, I'll talk more about the word pierced because there's um, disagreement about the interpretation of, of the Hebrew there. So just in summary, the entire outline of the crucifixion narrative can be constructed from Psalm 22. And Levine asks, well, why? And then provides us with four possibilities. One is that everything the Gospels report actually happened and is indeed in direct relationship with Psalm 22. That's a very conservative kind of literalistic view, uh, not one that I would share. Um, progressive Christians would not insist on the literal, literal rendering, given the time between the crucifixion and when the Gospels were written, the differences between the writings, and the tendency of the gospel writers to use the Hebrew scriptures as a template for telling the story of Jesus. So to amplify a little bit on that, uh, about the time between the crucifixion and when the gospels were written, um, if, if Jesus, uh, you know, is crucified in 33, Mark was probably written around 65 to 70, roughly around the time of the destruction of the temple. Gospel of Luke, 10 years after that, the Gospel of Matthew, 10 years after that, and the Gospel of John, 10 or 20 years after that. And so we're talking decades from the actual event. And we know how oral tradition works before things get written down, right? So I, I can't buy into a conservative view simply because I know that material gets shaped in the telling and um, so for it to be some kind of a, you know, almost like a, a reporter standing there writing down what happened just doesn't work. Also, the differences between the writings. Uh, Christians are familiar with the seven last words of Jesus from the cross. But in order to come up with seven comments of Jesus, you have to harmonize the Gospels in order to come up with them. And if those words from Jesus from the cross were so important, why don't all of them record seven that's that's not that many but they obviously had access to different traditions and the oral traditions were shaping uh the material differently so again another argument to say that you know this isn't a literal rendering of psalm 22 and then lastly the tendency of the gospel writers to use the hebrew scriptures as a template in telling the story of jesus that's something jews and christians have done for centuries, taking big biblical material and fashioning stories based on, on it. And so it's, uh, it, it's probably not surprising that Psalm 22 would mirror enough of the experiences of Jesus that the early earliest Christians would have seen the connection and then use that kind of as a template in order to tell the Jesus story. So I very much am in the latter camp and not in the conservative view, because I don't believe for a second that it's some kind of a, you know, a recording thing going on. So Levine says that another possibility as to why the crucifixion narrative is from uh, so close to Psalm 22 is that maybe Jesus just cried out, my God, that, I mean, just that much, and his followers then filled in the rest of the psalm, because they would have recognized those words um, as the beginning of the psalm and would have thought about the crucifixion and some of the material in the psalms would be reflective of what that crucifixion experience uh, would be. I find that a compelling, frankly, argument. Um, don't know, but um, we are quick, I think, um, in both the Hebrew scriptures and in the New Testament to kind of fill in the gaps where we don't know something. And so I can see that happening as a way of, of describing what the crucifixion was like. If, if, if Jesus did utter, you know, an, in a kind of a gasping way, my God, that if Psalm 22 came to mind and was remembered by those who were witnesses, it would be very easy to look at that Psalm and kind of fill in the blanks. A third possibility, Levine says, is that perhaps Jesus was just calling for Elijah, whose name in Hebrew is very similar to Eli, my God. And so if that's the case, um, then 
then it would be the common under that then there it takes you in a whole other direction mark and and uh, matthew both say when some bystanders heard the cry they said listen he's calling for elijah and it was a very common understanding that elijah would return to inaugurate the messianic age so maybe the misunderstanding that's another possibility that Levine uh, mentions. And a fourth possibility, the writer of Mark has placed the words on Jesus' lips. Um, if that were in fact the option, uh, he would not be, Mark would not be the first writer uh, to put, whoop, did I just lose it? Here we go, wait a sec. There. No, we, we still see it. Okay, you okay? Yeah. Um, Mark would not be the, the first, uh, a biblical writer to put words in the mouth of a biblical character, uh, because rarely do we ever have direct quotes of anyone. So obviously someone is fashioning uh, in order to tell the story. And so that's an interesting option as well. So his gospel in particular, that is Mark, emphasizes the suffering and death of Jesus and the lament language of, the, of Psalm 22 uh, leans in that direction, and so that might have been appealing to the, the writer of, of Mark. By way of summary at the very end of that uh, section, it says, did Jesus issue an inarticulate cry, a call for God, a call to Elijah, the first verse of Psalm 22? Did Mark, inspired by Psalm 22, compose the scene on the basis of piety rather than history? We have no secure way of answering these questions. We can, however, understand how the psalm originally functioned, explain how and why the New Testament readings changed the original meanings, and see how the psalm served as both parable and polemic in the post-biblical period. And so that's essentially what the rest of, of the chapter deals with. So just very briefly, because it's kind of an aside, almost like a, an excursion uh, that's a little bit fringe to the chapter, and that's how it's labeled. Uh, just a couple of other examples. The New Testament uses the Psalms elsewhere, and two in particular, uh, Psalm 69, excuse me, and 118, where it says in Psalm 69, they gave me poison for food, and for my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. That's reflected in all four of the Gospels uh, in the crucifixion scene, where someone ran, filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a stick, and gave it to Jesus to drink. The Gospel of John, Jesus tells the vendors at the temple, take these things out of here, stop making my father's house a marketplace. And his disciples remember that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. And that comes out of Psalm 69, verse 9. It is zeal for your house that has consumed me. The insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. John also uses 69 to detail how Jesus' own people, the Jews, generally reject him by quoting, more in number than the hairs of my head are those who hate me without cause. Many are those who would destroy me, my enemies who accuse me falsely. And so again, we see New Testament writers looking um, or making connections with uh, Hebrew texts. Psalm 69 also appears once in Acts, and it happens to refer to Judas, and twice in Romans, where enemies insult and reject. And then uh, Jesus' entry to Jerusalem reflects Psalm 118, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. And also, it's uh, a little later in this, uh, a little earlier in the psalm, Jesus quotes by saying um, about his rejection, the stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. So it's not surprising that, that the writers of a Jewish Messiah would look to the Hebrew scriptures um, for ways to understand the Christ event. And then the, the end of that section is this summary. Like the writers of the Dead Sea Scrolls and the rabbinic texts, Jesus and his disciples found their story in ancient scripture and in turn interpreted that scripture in light of their own experiences. Where they see Jesus throughout, the Jewish community interpreted the same Psalms in quite diverse ways. And what I uh, found interesting is the word diverse, because just in the same way that uh, Christians don't agree on, on the interpretations, I, th I think you know, where there's uh, 
two rabbis, there's 10 different opinions. So um, same dynamic in the, in the Christian community. Then there's a, a wonderful section, uh, uh, just as kind of a, an overview of the exegesis of, of uh, the Psalm 22. A reminder what the book of Psalms is. It's a compilation of liturgical poetry. It's intended for worship. And it's from many different periods with many different authors, which, and this may be troublesome to some, which indicates Davidic authorship is unlikely. At least, you know, you can't say that he wrote the whole Psalter. And the superscription that you see at the beginning of some of the Psalms, a Psalm of David, is a secondary addition to what we uh, what were originally anonymous poems. And that is a position um, based on scholarship that I would probably uh, affirm as well. Very few, if any, have Davidic scholarship, and it was common practice in antiquity to attach the name of someone that was revered and honored onto a piece of, of writing uh, as a way of honoring that, that person. Um, we would consider it something uh, literarily suspicious, but not in the ancient world. Second bullet point, we do not know who wrote Psalm 22, but the date is estimated to be from the pre-exilic period before the temple was destroyed in 586 but certainly long after the time of David. So it's not likely that David would have written Psalm 22. Some individuals compose their own prayers or psalms, usually in prose. Formal poetic prayers meant individuals went to a shrine or the Jerusalem temple and requested that a Levite rehearse a psalm that fit their circumstance. And for a fee, Levites could write a new psalm to fit a special circumstance, which was subsequently used for other worshipers as that Levite's repertoire expanded. So um, I, I found all that very interesting that Levine uh, shared uh, how many of the, the psalms would come into being. The categories of psalms arise from form critical methods. So there are different kinds of psalms, different types of psalms, and form critical uh, uh, way of doing biblical interpretation asks these two questions. What's the psalm genre? In other words, what, what kind of writing does it fall into? And what is the psalm social setting? Mm -hmm. From this analysis, Psalm 22 is an individual complaint song, Right. I mean, you can see that right away, the complaints. And it is conventional in structure. It opens with an invocation, offers numerous specific complaints, calls on God for help, offers God a motivation to hear the pleas, and concludes with certainty that the plea will be heard. And so that's kind of the outline of the entire um, uh, lament, and it is very typical. As typical of conventional laments, no precise diagnosis of the sufferer can be determined because of the lack of precision. The Psalms then can serve many situations, including Jesus' suffering or the cross. Although Psalm 22 appears, it appears that the sufferer in the Psalm has some serious illness. That's kind of the, the primary speculation of what's going on. But a lot of laments, the, what they're complaining about um, is left general enough that that allows the psalm to speak to many people in many different circumstances. Second bullet point, the psalms are poetic and reflect different structures of Hebrew poetry. Um, that's an entire um, field in and of itself, the different types of, of Hebrew uh, poetry and the parallelisms and the different ways that poetry lines um, are are portrayed and how they emphasize different different things. Third, the laments are not limited to the actions of enemies. Psalm 22 begins with a complaint against God. Just think about that for a minute, which expresses a divine abandonment, usually for no legitimate reason, because typically the sufferer of the lament uh, proclaims their innocence, and so they they want to know why have you forsaken me? There's no good reason for you to be away. And the way Levine puts it, and thereby challenges the justice of God. And so in the cry, you're really challenging God to be just. You know, hear me. If you're God and I am innocent and you have this kind of track record, God, of, of saving and caring for your people, I mean, it's almost like in the lament, 
you're making your case as to why God should act. Psalm 22 contains calls for divine assistance, often in the imperative, which means literally commanding God. Ancient Israel had no problem uttering commands to God, especially in the laments. Same thing with um, uh, shouting out to God honestly that you feel abandoned. Um, what I love about the Psalms is that it's their raw emotion often, and in the, the laments in particular, um, even going after God is God is fair game. And so it, 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 things are so bad often in laments that there is demands to God to act. Sounds kind of rude, but, you know, when your back's against the wall, you say exactly what it is you need and what you want God to do. And lastly, like many laments, Psalm 22 offers reasons why God should listen. A description of illness to move God to sympathy, noting that giving aid is part of the divine nature, reminding God that God has rescued in the past, you know, kind of building your case as to why God should, should act. Although Psalm 22 is a conventional individual lament, it has a few distinct features, and Levine points out that it piles on rhetorical arguments that are unattested. In other words, they can make all these arguments and there's no counter argument. It uses extensive animal metaphors, and I, I think you probably heard that as I was reading it, of both the sufferer and the persecutors. Unlike many laments, it does not call for vengeance or curse against enemies, and Levine suggests that that might be uh, what made this psalm particularly attractive to followers of Jesus. And this psalm is more tightly structured than most psalms. So those are some unique characteristics in an otherwise pretty standard uh, lament psalm. Then to get to this business about pierced, there have been significant differences in interpretation about the word for pierced in various translations. The Hebrew word, and Josh, how, how do you say that properly? I just lost everything. Yes. No. Hang on just a minute. There we go. Back. I was Run. muted. I'm sorry. Um, That's okay. Hang so, on a second. Yeah. Let me uh, get the exact pronunciation. What verse is it? So I can look at the Is it black again? Uh -huh. Yes. Yeah, it's black, but you can hear me, right? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Okay. Well, that's good. Um, anyway, Kriya in Hebrew is to tear. So I think that's, that's what it's talking about. But uh, Again, what yes. verse, what verses? Yeah, covered? it's in uh, twenty-two, uh, uh, verse sixteen. Okay, hold on one second. Let's see if I can pick it up here. Um, verse sixteen. Kaari, yeah, all right. So kaari, as opposed to Korea. Ka'ari also can mean like a lion, which I know is one of the things that the author right. yeah. proposed. Um, it's not a word that I'm familiar with, though, in terms of meaning pierced. So Because I lost my PowerPoint, just let me say this much. It's a, it's a word that's contested and, and can mean shriveled, lions, pierced. It can mean a number of different things depending upon... Um, you know, what manuscript you're working from. Um, those who are New Testament writers tended to work from the Greek instead of the Hebrew. And there were some decisions made about the Greek uh, where it's translated as gouged. And they've just, they made an interpretive jump from gouged as in digging into to the word pierced. And so the question is, it's not clear exactly what the original Hebrew meant, and what happened then, it says in the book, it says, therefore, neither Jewish apologists who accuse Christians of misreading the text, nor Christian commentaries um, uh, who feel that the uh, Jews have corrupted the text, neither one of them uh, are on very solid ground. 
So the commentator includes... Rashi, the the famous commentator, says like a lion, like a lion. lion. Yep. In fact, that's fits... the translation that's used in the in the Jewish publication society. And that works uh, simply because lion and animals and whatnot are referenced, and so there's there's good good reason uh, and background for it. Uh, the Christian world tends to move into the into the word pierced, and so it's one place where there's some uh, disagreements. Uh, the last section that that I had, Josh, was uh, when Psalms become prophecy. Um, it's it's not a section that I like very much. Um, in in order to have kind of the traditional view that would say Psalm twenty two is a prophetic writing that essentially predicts the Messiah that Jesus came to fulfill. Um, I don't like that view, and it's kind of crumbled uh, in the last hundred years because uh, scholarship tends to say that David was not the writer of it and therefore wasn't predicting anything. Jewish writings do not um, do not um, talk about the Psalms as prophetic anywhere. And so, it, it And it also leans into, I think, a use of the word prophetic in a way that I'm uncomfortable with. Prophecy, and when the prophets speak, typically is a word for, from God for a specific people, for a specific time, for a specific purpose. And if there are future connotations, it's not fortune-telling, it's, you know, it's the consequences of something that will happen to you in the future if you don't turn your hearts back to God, or you don't tend to the poor, or you don't, you know, worship God with a pure heart, or what, whatever the issue the prophet is dealing with. So using scripture as fortune telling, I think, is slippery ground anyway. And so I think what I think what the Christian community did is more like what I talked about earlier. They found in Psalm 22, some metaphorical language that seemed to fit what they knew about the cross experience of Jesus. And they appropriated that in order to tell the story, in order to understand the story, in order to ground it in their own Jewish heritage. And what's, what's interesting to me is um, while most Christians could tell you quite a bit about the crucifixion story, very few of them could tell you very much about Psalm 22, and yet it's riddled all the way through the, the, the crucifixion story. Shoot, I wanted to show the last, last PowerPoint slide, Josh, because the last section is yours, and I actually had a football player handing a, a football to another player so that I could hand it off to you, So, but you're just going to have to imagine it. Well, if it's Tom Brady, that would have been really great. <laughs> oh, thank you, Dwayne. It was really wonderful. And for this, we decided that this chapter would be better for, you know, for, for the Jewish part of it to be somewhat secondary. It doesn't mean it's less important, but it's shorter because just as perhaps uh, people who belong to, you know, one of the local churches may not recognize Psalm 22. Jews would have no idea what it is, except that it's the number between 21 and 23. 23 <laughs> is actually, you know, the Psalm we all recognize, the 23rd Psalm. Mm. 22 is not. Um, so I put, by the way, into the chat the link to the chapter so that you can read uh, read it on your own if you'd like to if you haven't had a chance um i if i were to have chosen by myself which chapters of this book to do i think i would have chosen this chapter primarily because it's the least likely chapter that that i would want to do um i'm just going to spotlight on me so people can see me uh, anyway, because it has no connection really to Jewish liturgy and Psalm's basic purpose 
in Judaism is through liturgy. There are other purposes for Psalms. Psalms are great inspiration. They tell us a little bit of history. Um, they correspond to parts of the Bible as we saw with the New Testament and also with the Old Testament. Hannah's prayer, um, David's laments, are, are, have a uh, book of Samuel and in the Psalms there's some parallels, but primarily it's liturgy. Primarily it's through prayer as uh, the, the chapter also described. The Levites, you know, you give them a buck and they'll do a Psalm for you to express the mood that you feel. <laughs> now, if you look at a, at a Jewish, at a prayer book, a Sidur, um, you'll see that about half of the Psalms, maybe a third to a half of the 150 Psalms, find their way into our liturgy at some point during the course of the year. Primarily, we'd be talking weekdays and Shabbat. This one's not on that list. You will, it's, and yet it is surprising that there are certain elements in this Psalm that are familiar to Jewish audiences. Some of them are not mentioned in the chapter, and I'm gonna to get to those in a second. But it is definitely mentioned and worth noting that um, the rabbis did pay some attention to this psalm in the Talmud and prior, um, thinking of it in terms of David, the subject being David, who lived a pretty horrible life despite being king, had a lot of suffering, could easily have written some of the verses that are in this psalm. Whether or not he actually wrote the psalm, it's ascribed to David. Um, another very important biblical figure that's central to this psalm in the Jewish view is Esther, of all people, Queen Esther. Uh, and, and that starts before the New Testament period. We, we talked in our first session, we've talked a few times about the Septuagint. That's the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible that became authoritative and was more of a basis for the New Testament writings than the Hebrew Bible itself, which caused lots of things you know, like the translation of Alma, the young woman, in Isaiah. We talked about that in our first session. Um, maybe second. It was one of those first two sessions. Anyway, Esther is brought up in the Septuagint. And things that are not found in the Bible itself um, are found in the Septuagint, also the Dead Sea Scrolls, that connect the story of Esther to this psalm. The suffering that Esther goes through, representing the Jewish people, who are um, to be destroyed in the Purim story, as you might recall. So it's it's a time of in parallel suffering, not exactly the same suffering as what Jesus went through, but what Haman wanted to do to the Jews is basically the same thing, impale them, uh, impale Mordechai, and, um, and kill the Jewish people, destroy the Jewish people. Esther knows that she has all of this in front of her, and she's the queen, who, by the way, has been raped, and uh, or trafficked um, and that's an element you find in her suffering so you can see all of that you can feel that emotion the one thing that the book of esther doesn't have that this psalm has in its very first word and this psalm has in its second word is god's name Eli, Eli, my god my god those two words my god my god Eli, Eli, are they, they evoke such emotion such despair, um, a hint of theodicy. Uh, it's a word that's worth explaining if uh, you're not familiar with it. It's not the sister volume to the Iliad. Um, theodicy is the uh, trying to explain basically why bad things happen to good people. Where is God? Why is God not doing something to help us right now? Esther could have been asking that question. At the same time, this uh, book, this psalm rather, does not go heavy-handedly into a book of Job type of exposition of where is God or how can God allow this kind of suffering, but it hints at it. And it hints at it with those two words, which also is hinting at wanting God to intervene in history. Book of Esther is famous for not having God's name at all. Part, it's the only biblical book. I'm not sure about Song of Songs. That's all allegory. So, but anyway, Book of Esther for sure has does not have God in it, and yet God is all over the narrative. If you look at it allegorically, if you look at it symbolically, God is guiding this whole process. But the book has the human beings as being really the prime movers, and in the case of Esther and her cousin uncle slash 
trafficker, Mordecai, um, sponsor, I don't know. Um, they're the heroes. They are definitely the, the human heroes of the story. So you have this complementary relationship between Psalm 22 and the book of Esther. And because of that, there are Purim songs primarily in the Sephardic rite, the, um, that's the, the culture of Jews from the Middle East uh, or from the Arab world, from Spain originally, that's what the word Sephardic means. Um, you'll see that in their Purim celebrations. So anyway, this started to happen before the New Testament, before the, the, it's the events of the first century. The, um, the Septuagint, as I mentioned, is a couple of centuries earlier. And what you find happening is fascinating once it's clear that this becomes a central proof text or narrative connected to the New Testament, you see the rabbis shying away from it. You see them running in the other direction from Psalm 22, not wanting to have really anything to do with it, except that it pops up a few times again and again with, with regarding Esther. Um, you see also, I think this is also a really interesting phenomenon, that Purim is virtually unknown in the Christian world. I mean, I can't say that. Obviously, my clergy colleagues would have some knowledge of it, but um, it's not considered a major Jewish holiday in any sense, even by Jews, but I think much more, it's much more present as a Jewish holiday. It's, a, it's sort of a, an, an ethnocentric Jewish holiday because it's talking about Jewish peoplehood, the Jewish people threatened with destruction in the diaspora. It's a story we, Jews can all relate to, especially Jews in the diaspora, but it's not one that would be interacted um, much in, in Christian sources. And, and maybe Dwayne has uh, other thoughts about that. But um, so you find between Psalm 22 and Purim this, this uh, disconnect um, where one faith chooses one and one faith chooses the other. Um, Psalm 22 is basically ignored by Jews, except for Purim, which is basically ignored by Christians. What that means, I'm not so sure. But I want to add a couple of points um, that, that are, in my mind, very interesting and not mentioned in the chapter. And I'm wondering why he didn't. I, well, I think basically they're, they're Bible scholars, and they are super Bible scholars. Um, this is a great book. If you haven't started reading it, I, I, I love this class because it just brings up so many questions. But when you look at Psalm 22, you also have to look at Zionism. Because in modern Israel, the Bible has been reclaimed and Psalms have been reclaimed. Um, anything that can be connected to the geography of the land has a place in the modern Israeli, modern Zionist, the um, the Chalutzim, the pioneers that came, they would name their places after the Bible. So, for instance, the Evan Maasu, you know, the um, the rock that becomes the cornerstone that we talked about with Psalm 118, that is a psalm that has a huge place in both traditions, both faith traditions. Um, the rest of that sentence, Evan Maasu Habonim, the cornerstone, Hayata Lerosh Pina, um, the name of a, of one of the first settlements in Israel. Now it's a city in the north is Rosh Pina. Right near, right near Rosh Pina, not far from it, because that generation of, of pioneers um, used a lot of Bible in their naming, there is a kibbutz. And the kibbutz is a beautiful kibbutz. It's one of the central kibbutzes of the north. And literally, I guess you don't want to say this, a stone's throw. You know, we're talking about the Holy Land, but it's not far from the Sea of Galilee, from the Mount of Beatitudes, from Capernaum, and it's called Ayelet Hashachar, the deer of the dawn, the deer of the dawn. The first sentence of this psalm is un translated, actually, in the Jewish translation because it, it's really hard to explain what it means. So before they have the Eli Eli, this is the title, this is the caption um, for the leader, a Psalm of David, on Ayelet Hashachar. And the translation that we've seen is the deer, Shachar is dawn. So you have the, the deer of the dawn, you know, the, the deer that runs at the dawn, at the time of dawn when the sun is coming up. Um, it is a beautiful image. 
And it, by the way, is the symbol. Remember, we talked about this being uh, filled with animals. The, be- the fauna of this psalm is gorgeous, unless you know you happen to be a defender of dogs as I am, and you're just wondering, what did they have against dogs back then? It's like in the Bible, it's in the Torah, it's everywhere. They just didn't like dogs, and, and not, well, they were afraid of them. But they loved deer. <laughs> deer were beautiful creatures, and up in north in Israel, these are the forests, the mountains, the hills, sloping down to the Sea of Galilee. It doesn't get more beautiful than that. This kibbutz, I've stayed on it. It has a guest house. It has Jeep rides up to the Golan Heights. It's right near the bridges that were blown up um, during the uh, end of the British mandate. Um, It was a key event in the 1947-1948 Israel War of Independence. And it has sunflowers like you'll never see. It has an ostrich farm. I mean, it's it's like it's it's like Garden of Eden. If we want to go back to last week, anyway, Ayelet Hashachar is um, is a beautiful name. It's a beautiful kibbutz, and the da, the deer is the symbol of the tribe of Naphtali. If you go to Temple Bethel and you look up above the ark, you'll see the different tribal symbols in stained glass it's one of the most beautiful parts of the sanctuary in my opinion the colors are just gorgeous and so diverse you see naftali there and you'll see this hind this deer you know sort of running uh leaping and that is the symbol of the tribe whose territory in the bible was assigned to that area so it's not just by mistake it's also by the way the um symbol of the israeli postal service and they wish they could be as fast as a deer. It's not so good. Um, although much better than it was because no one's using the mail anymore. Um, back in the day when I was a student for a year in Jerusalem, we used to send these little flimsy aerograms. That you'd fold over and you'd lick and whatever. And three weeks later, my mother would read it back in Boston. So that, uh, but Ayelet HaShachar, great kibbutz. I was going to show you a whole slideshow. I decided not to do that. Um, what's fascinating is that they chose that title, Psalm 22, no problem. And the, the Christian overtones of the Psalm, no problem for them and um, in other contexts in Israel. But one thing, there aren't a lot, you know, there is a very significant Christian community there, but in, numerically it's not that large. But I wonder if in some sense, this uh, kibbutz name was chosen in part to rebel against the the Jewish fear over so many years of antagonizing, you know, in in Russia and Poland, wherever um, the majority um, by perhaps, um, you know, going into the core story, uh, the core narrative of the New Testament. I don't know. Perhaps it's it's done uh, out of being so close to the site of the Sermon on the Mount. I mean, it's it's just fascinating. It's right nearby. In fact, I'm sure a lot of pilgrims stay at Ayala de Shachar in their guest house. All right. So, and by the way, you can put questions in the chat if you want. I want to give you one more example of Psalm 22 that blows my mind, and you'll see why. In um, late 19th century, um, this psalm gave birth to a song, Eli, Eli, which is not the Hanasenish song, Eli, Eli, da, 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 not that song. It's a song based on the first verse of this psalm, Eli, Eli, Lama Azavtani. In Hebrew, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? And then the song goes into Yiddish, and then it comes back to Hebrew, with the Shema, the the last the the hero Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Shema Israel Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad, and it was it was uh, writ- written by someone for a Yiddish operetta, in which a Jewish girl sings a song of despair while being crucified for her faith. The song, as I said, begins in Hebrew, goes into Yiddish. It is, and then it was popularized by some of the great cantors of the early 20th century, including Yossela Rosenblatt, one of the greatest cantors of the classic age, who sang it in The Jazz Singer. 
it blew everyone away. Of course, that's not what we all remember about the jazz singer. Some of it is not so wonderful with the blackface and all that. But it was it, it was it became a standard of great cantors of that time. But what's more fascinating is then it was incorporated into um, into the, the in, into black music. Um, so you you see it being sung by by greats. Um, great singers, great musicians um, who were Jewish and who were Black. And this is, of course, Black History Month. And it speaks to both experiences collectively. The Jewish people see this. And, and going back to rabbinic times, you see hints of this too. This, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me, is about the Jewish people. We're the ones, you know, in a sense, on the cross, if you want to use that imagery. And for the black experience, it certainly fits um, with their experiences here in America, especially. Um, but the crying out to God has become a universal cry. And um, and that's, in my mind, fascinating, but that's not the most fascinating thing. Because as I was doing this investigation, I didn't really know about the, I knew a little about the Yiddish song, but I didn't know where, really where it came from. My father was a cantor. You, some of you know that. And he sang this. And I have a recording of it. And I'm not going to play all of it, but I do want to play part of it because I want you to hear the emotion. And I, you know, I used to hear him singing this while I was growing up. So if you will indulge me, um, it, it will say four minutes. I'm going to skip a little bit in the middle so it won't be four minutes long. And um, <laughs> unless you insist, um, so I want you to hear this. Whoops, I have to get out of this because I think I need to in improve the sound quality, share sound, optimize for video. Is that right? Do I do that? Well, whatever. Let's see if it works. All right. <laughs> going to move this up ahead a little because I want you to hear the ending. Don't ask me to sing that. Um, <laughs> I, I, you know, it's just, just wonderful. Let me read the translation of the Yiddish. In fire and flame have men been tortured, 
and everywhere we went, we were shamed and ridiculed. No one could make us turn away from our faith, from you, my God, from your holy Torah, your law. And this was written before the Holocaust. This was written during the pogrom era. But to hear that and to read that, and then to, I mean, to, with, with incredible respect, to talk about the Christian narrative, which is called the passion, and uh, quintessential passion um, is found in this Psalm um, in, in, in all our traditions. And beyond that, I mean, so, so the power of this Psalm, which has been totally ignored in the Jewish liturgy, because um, Purim has a lot of passion too, uh, is just astounding. So anyway, I want to leave my presentation at that and um, see if anyone has any questions or Dwayne, if you want to say anything. What what strikes me is in the same way uh, Jews have kind of ignored Psalm 22, so too most Christians, I think, pretty much ignore Esther. It's not often that there are Bible studies on Esther or that it comes in, in our uh, lectionary readings on, on a Sunday morning during worship. Um, for, for those of you with Jewish background, um, not only is Psalm 22 woven through the crucifixion account, but you know, in the congregation I serve at St. John's, it is the conclusion to Monday, Thursday worship. So that would be the Thursday of Holy Week, the evening before um, Good Friday when Jesus was crucified. And we remember, um, we remember the Last Supper where Jesus is celebrating the Passover with his disciples. He washes disciples' feet. And so uh, during worship, we do foot washing. Um, and then at the very end of the service, um, the uh, Psalm 22 is read, and while I'm reading it, the altar is stripped away, all of the furnishings in the front of the church, all the liturgical hangings are removed, and so by the time I'm done reading that lengthy psalm, everything has been removed from the primary area of our worship space, and um, the, the lights then dim, and there is silence, and people exit in a fairly dark sanctuary, uh, and there's not a word spoken. It's very quiet as people are leaving, and that sets the stage for Good Friday. And so the last thing that people hear when they leave uh, worship uh, every year on Monday, Thursday, is the entirety of Psalm 22. And so in that reading, it just reinforces the connection to the crucifixion for those who are Christian and are listening to it. So I just wanted to, to tell you how it's used and the, the place that it holds um, in our worship life and Holy Week and Easter would, would be within the course of one week, you know, the holiest time of year for, for Christians. There's a, a question in the chat Norman had put in. Um about the Quran, I mean, obviously, uh, you know, not an expert, but uh, I do know that the Psalms are made reference to in the Quran. I don't know about this specific one. Uh, I'm sure the crucifixion story is uh, dealt with, and um, I don't know, Duane, if you have any information on that. Not a clue, way outside of my wheelhouse. So we need to make this a trialogue instead of a dialogue, I think. Apparently. But um, we will do that. Actually, we're talking. Um, we're talking with Mark about doing a um, some program um, in March because Ramadan leads right into Passover and Easter this year. They they overlap, which uh, can be fascinating, um, and we can ask questions about each of uh, each of those festivals. Uh, does anyone have any other questions? I'd be curious to know what people have heard tonight. Just what did you hear when you when you when we click off? What what will your takeaway be? I'm fine. How are you? Hi. <laughs> Someone's on the phone. Got it. Uh, anyone? Just curious if if anyone would be willing to share. What is it that your takeaway will be?
or not <laughs> or not <laughs> I, you know i think we we did i mean you you really got oh. into the psalm but um in the book you can you can analyze it a little bit more and i think it deserves a lot of attention in and of itself um aside from its connections to these other materials we're talking about because it's a fascinating study of someone who has very ambivalent feelings about God and about suffering and uh, about animals. <laughs> and uh, it's, you know, feeling depressed and, and, and yet at the same time having some hope. Um, it really is very modern in that sense. And, uh, you know, I think it does make sense to, and you can find it online anywhere with any Bible translation you prefer to use. Um, it's, you know, you, you should really look at this psalm as and try to understand where it's coming from and how it reflects your own experiences, your own feelings, your own doubts, because uh, it, it's really an amazingly modern piece of literature. Don mentioned wanting to read the book of Esther. So um, we could certainly discuss it at some point, but um, the best thing I can do for you right now there's a website called Safaria, S-E-F-A-R-I-A, -S and it has the entire Hebrew Bible, of course, in translation as well. And um, you can read it. So I'm going to put into the chat right now a link to the Safaria Book of Esther. And there it is. So you can click on that. And you go chapter by chapter. It's not that long. When we read it out loud on Purim, and you're certainly welcome to come um, when we do it out loud as part of our service, uh, it takes about 45 minutes to read. So it's about 10 chapters. So any other questions? Yes. All right. Yes. We got one there. We got, we do. Good. Is, unmute there you go uh -oh. go what ahead struck, what struck me as i read before this uh, program psalm 22 how different religions interpret the same psalm so differently yeah i think we've been finding that about all the the things we've been reading the the garden of eden story last week and the things we did in our first semester um next week will be a little different uh son of man i'm not yeah. sure you know i haven't read that chapter yet but it'll be interesting to see where uh, where that one is going one of the things that i think i've appreciated about the way levine does the the book um pointing out the differences and the history of interpretation because both of our traditions have evolved often in the interpretation and even within our own bodies, don't agree, um, but usually concludes each, each section by saying, you know, that the scriptures continue to speak. They're kind of, they're still living, uh, the living word, if you will, and, and still and still are universal in a way that it's worthy to continue to interpret and to continue to honor uh, the different ways of, of, of looking at something. For example, um, the Psalm 22, you know, they conclude with, you know, how universal is it that someone feels abandoned by God when something is not going well in life? And so anyone, regardless of background, would, would be able to mine Psalm 22 and still find some incredible value. So I like how Levine always ends up pulling it together and saying there's a universality about it that that we hold in common and i think that's very uh, very good approach uh in in doing interfaith kind of work you know and i think it's worth saying that um although of course we engage in very constructive and em empathetic dialogue where we're really trying to hear the other that's not necessarily what went on in ancient times uh and we saw that with the isaiah passages you don't see it as much here, but one thing that uh, is in the chapter is uh, the assertion that Esther um, 
the commentary about Esther being a reflection of the words of Psalm 22 is an anti-Christian polemic. The Psalm, the commentators, the rabbis are saying, is about the queen in her distress and not about Jesus on the cross. Um, and then Jerome later on says, uh, he insists that this Psalm should not be understood in reference to Mordechai and Esther. So there was a little tussle back and forth. He knew what his Jewish neighbors were doing to this day, ironically, and then we've said this, while the book of Esther is read in its entirety on Purim, it plays a be at best a minor role in Christian lectionaries. So there's some passive aggressive behavior that's going on and maybe just purely aggressive in trying to say, no, this is not about the cross and no, it's not about Esther. Um, I think the fact is, and I'll, you know, speaking as a rabbi, it's not, it's not that Psalm 22 is a proof text for the Christian narrative, but it certainly was set up in such a way that it supports the narrative, or at least if one reads it in a literalist sense, it supports the narrative. And there's no way to counteract that. You know, it's, it, it, it is what it is. It's, you know, you can say, well, it's not historical, but within itself, um, internally, it's consistent. And um, so it's not worth getting into that argument. And we could just find our own, we can find our own sanctity in those words, which are still sacred to all of us. Yes. So, you know, what, what, did someone have a question or you? I, I, I like the universality that you mentioned before about taking Psalm 22 and thinking of it in terms of the Holocaust, the Black experience. Yes. And even bringing it up to date, it probably should be the Ukrainian national anthem right now. And they should wake up every morning th thinking of Psalm 22 and, and watching those children being killed over there and watching everybody under the uh, threat of missiles and bombing. So it does have universality even up to today. We can hope for a happier ending. Yes. But absolutely. And I think, you know, if Psalm 22 is their anthem, I, I would lean also on the, the ending of the psalm that is finally a word of hope. Um, so, so needed when you're crying out to God absolutely. and feeling abandoned. Yeah. yeah. So are we going to call it a night? I think we will. Thank you. So thanks everybody. Uh, yes. Next Thursday, last one. Thank you all so much. We'll uh, we'll have a recording, a video available. Um, hopefully, I'm just concerned that YouTube might think that my father's uh, album is not um, owned by me and <laughs> might uh, take it offline <laughs> for copyright purposes. Um, but we'll see. So. <laughs> Anyway, but Mark will be back next week. It'll be the three of us, and I'm looking forward to it. All right. Thank you, Rabbi. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Okay. Good can night. You, can you send us the 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 word the word the the, the writing that we worked from? Can yeah, I, I put it in the chat. Let me. I'll, uh, um, do you? Can you see it? I'll I'll put it in there again if you don't. Okay, it's probably it's probably there. It's on top. Okay. Of the chat. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Really enjoyed the cantor singing. Thank you so much. I, I was really a highlight. appreciate that. Definitely yeah, highlight. I, you know, he has wonderful breath control. <laughs> well, he could hold the notes. <laughs> he passed away many years ago, and um, you know, it just brings me a lot of joy if I can occasionally bring him back to life in some small way. Oh, I know. Yeah. Right. Enjoyable to hear him. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Take care, Dwayne. I'll see you. Bye. Bye.